Pat, thanks so very much for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, Great to be here and love the Computer History Museum and anything I can do to support it is really an honor. Oh, that's great to hear. Um, we'd like to begin at the beginning and just ask you a little bit about, um, first of all, when and where you were born. Yeah, I was uh, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, March 5th, 1961, the Amish, Pennsylvania, Dutch Mennonite area of Pennsylvania. So I was born and raised into a farming family. Uh, dad was number uh, nine of 10 kids. And growing up, I always thought I was going to be a farmer. And uh, you know, dad, as, the, as number nine, never had his own farm. Uh, so all of the siblings, you know, number, grandpa helped number one, two, three, four. You know, got down to dad at number nine. He says, just work with your siblings, right? We don't need any more farms in the family. But had he had a farm, I'd be a farmer today. Was this in Lancaster County? It's actually Berks then? County, Berks right? County. Lancaster, Lebanon, Berks, right? All in that okay. area okay. of Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, and, and I really describe it as uh, the Cinderella career because when I was 16, I accidentally took a scholarship exam uh, to Lincoln Tech in Allentown, Pennsylvania, okay. and, I, and I won. I wasn't supposed to take it until the following year, but I took it, I won. So I ended up skipping my last year and a half of high school. And uh, so literally at 18 years old, I graduated with my associate's degree. I had gotten enough credits to graduate from high school, and Intel came recruiting. And uh, so at 18 years old, I'm being recruited by Intel to come out to interview on the West Coast. Right? There's sort of an industry-wide shortage for technicians. So uh, you know, here I am, 18 years old. I've never been on an airplane, and I'm being given a free trip to California. Right? It's like, sign me up. But I promised my mom, you know, they're crazy out in California. I'm not going there, right? Uh, I'm a Pennsylvania farm boy. And, uh, you know, a few months later, boom, I'm moving so, to California. So before you get to, get to that, I mean, you, you, the, the 16 years or whatever before you went to Lincoln Tech, did you do any technical stuff? Do you have hobbies or, you know, you must have had some interest beyond the farm or? You know, a, a little bit, you know, I did a little bit and, you know, they had a sort of a Votex school that I sort of played around with electronics a little bit and uh, sort of was intrigued by it. Obviously had a good acumen in math and science and, you know, I thought English was a waste of time and, you know, it was sort of, you know, you know, your natural geeky kind of uh, guy. And then at Lincoln Tech's, the first time I touched a computer, right, uh, you know, some of those, uh, you know, DDP, uh, you know, 23s, I did a punch cards, did some of the for early, you know, TRS-80s and played around with it. And this idea that I could tell something what to do and it would redo it, right, to me it was just like, wow, right? And I was good at it, right? So I really got into the technology as I was, you know, you know coming there and, you know, it was one of those, the first time you sort of tasted it, sort of like, ah, oh, yeah. So were there any of your teachers during high school or whatever that sort of told you, hey, you're really good at this math and science stuff, you ought to think of something beyond the farm, or, you know, any encouragement to do so, or? Yeah, there was, uh, and, uh, you know, a couple of the uh, teachers, the Votech, electronics, you know, and I'll tell you, at the time, it was more, you know, be an electrician was a little bit more. You first started touching, right, you know, and doing wiring and turning lights on and some of your, you know, everybody has to program a, you know, a little traffic controller and, you know, uh, those types of things. So some very rudimentary uh, things, but so definitely some encouragement there. And I was sort of this wandering uh, kid where, you know, I always thought I was going to be a farmer and what's a farmer without a farm, right? You know, lost and confused. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and every, every step of the way into electronics and electrical and eventually touching computers. It's like, yeah, this is a pathway I was pretty excited about. Now, your father had, there were 10 kids in his family. How many? In yeah, we're, we're four, four, right? So we were smallish, right, right uh, in the family. An older sister, I was the oldest son, and then two younger brothers. And in a farming family, the first boy, I was special. I could do no wrong in my you know, parents' eyes. And this idea of moving to California, boy, you can't let your son. You know, that was like, you know, in California, they have earthquakes, colds. I mean, you're crazy out here, right? So there's a lot of those negative premonitions, uh, you know, from a very uh, Germanic, uh, very uh, uh, non-diverse community, right, uh, there. And that's just what it was. You know, Did so any of your siblings uh, leave the 
area or are they all they're, they're, they're all back there all so back there. i am the black sheep uh and uh you know when i moved out here and for three years i was back in boston with emc mm -hmm. And the family was sort of like, oh, the black sheep is coming home. And uh, then I moved back here to become the VMware or a CEO. And it's sort of like, he's hopeless. <laughs> and uh, What do you do? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, really some of that is, right, you know, when I had to explain my, you know, my mom was pretty, you know, eventually they got the idea of what silicon was. Right, you know, you could show it, you could touch it, you could feel it, right? You know, systems, okay, you know, you put lots of silicon things and put sheet metal around it, okay, I get it. Software, huh? What are you talking about? People pay you for that? What do you, you know? <laughs> so it was a pretty hard to get them this idea of going from silicon to systems to software. What on earth is that? Um, was uh, was reading a big part of your early life? Were you were you a reader, or were you more outside? Um, if, I mean, those aren't a natural contrast. But was reading a big part of your life? Yeah, it was a you know say anything that was engineering oriented. You know, and uh, some of that was reading. You know, I wasn't a big fiction reader, but you know, historical uh, reading. Uh, clearly, you know, super good in math and you know, science, physics, those type of subjects. I always did well at. But I was pretty outdoorsy as well. I spent a lot of time working on the farm. You know, uh, I was a, a hunter with all of my relatives. You know, you know, the first day of hunting season was a, a school holiday, so we were all there, right? You know, that was probably more important than any other national. Holiday. Holiday, the first day of hunting season, right? You know, you never missed it, and uh, so the, all those outside things were really important. And I just say it was a, you know, it was a very diverse and wonderful uh, upbringing uh, that way. Um, well, maybe we could talk. Uh, well, I know that um, your uh, involvement with religion has been a major theme throughout your life to this day. Was it was it kind of a major theme of your household growing up? Yeah, it was a very traditional religious environment there. You know, you went to church on Sunday because that's what you did, right? You know, it was part of the social fabric of that uh, community. As I sort of joke, I was baptized with full knowledge of what I was doing when I was six days old. Because right? <laughs> <laughs> that's what you did. Right, and uh, you know, I was president of the youth group because you know I was uh, you know uh, you know sort of a, some natural leadership skills. But I really came to become a Christian when I moved to California, which is sort of exactly the opposite of what you would have expected. And uh, you know, as I as I like to joke, uh, uh, there was two good reasons to go to church when I was a kid. You know, one was to meet girls and impress their mothers and grandmothers. Right? And the other was not to get in trouble with dad, right? So, you know, well, that's pretty good. You know, meet girls, impress mom. And uh, so when I moved to California, what did I do? Hey, I'm going to go to church to meet girls. And sure enough, the first Sunday at church, I met Linda, right, who uh, eventually became my uh, bride. And uh, really, the I'll say the young adults group there really sort of, uh, you know, brought me in. And I really came to that point. Actually, fairly soon after moving to California in February of 1980, I moved here uh, in October of uh, 1979 and uh, became a Christian. And uh, really, uh, uh, in many ways, that just became this you know, fundamental shift of my value system, who I was. And uh, a few months later, I felt like I was being called to become a minister. Right? So here I am, and I'm so excited about computing and you know, microprocessors and working at Intel. I'm good at it. I'm now at Santa Clara working on my bachelor's degree, and you know, just everything is going great. It's sort of like, God, what are you talking about? Become a minister? You know, that's not what I want to be. And so I wrestled with God and argued with God for a few months over this and uh, came to a point where I said, okay, I'll, uh, you know, if this happens, right, I will become a minister. And immediately when I sort of have gotten to that point of giving up, right, if you would, or really uh, submitting myself, the answer was be a workplace minister, right? You're a full-time minister in the workplace. And that just changed everything about my perspective because a few people as, as uh, Christians or of people of faith are called to be full-time ministers or full-time clergy or full-time imams, or, right? Most of us are called to express our faith 
in the workplace, in the school place, in the marketplace, in the home place. And that's really been what I view as my calling since then. You know, is be a, a great leader of my projects, technical contributor, so on, but also then being able to express my faith in very appropriate ways in the workplace as well. And that was, it, you had um, that sort of clarity as a young person at that time. You know, that, I mean, you were as, um, was that something that immediately came into focus for you, or did you develop cl more clarity about that over time? Well, I, I'd say somewhat both, yeah. right? Where it was like day one, boom, it just changed my perspective, mm. right? You know, where, you know, this idea of being a workplace minister, and I really started to really, you know, resonate with that and what that means and, you know, how you really, you know, view yourself as uh, working for God as your CEO, even though you're working for Intel. Uh, and at the same time, you know, it was clearly something that, boy, I developed more and more understandings as I became more both mature in my own faith, mm -hmm. as well as a more meaningful leader in the workplace. And as I became a manager, well, what does that mean? And how does that look like when you have people working for you? You know, what's inbounds and what out of bounds? And you know, as you became a second level manager, as you became a director, a vice president, a senior vice president, and now a CEO, how do you express that in the most appropriate ways? And so it clearly uh, is something that's a learning area as well. Right. Fascinating. Well, maybe we could jump back a little bit. Yeah, we need to go, go back ahead, to. Uh, Lincoln Tech? Yeah. yeah. And uh, you sort of stumbled into it almost. Uh, you, were you excited about going? I mean, was it, or was it just something new? To, you said it wasn't intentional, it doesn't sound like. Well, you know, when I won the scholarship, it was sort of like, oh, right? And so we went to Lincoln Tech, and they says, boy, you're supposed to be a senior when you take this, not a junior. And uh, it says, well, uh, can you keep the scholarship for a year uh, till I graduate? And they said, no. Right, you know, you have to redo it for next year. It's like, so I would go back to my uh, high school uh, guidance uh, counselor. They said, well, you can take it. You just got to get some more credits to backfill, and you can still graduate from high school uh, that way. And uh, generally, you know, as uh, I think a lot of you know, uh, uh, you know, junior, senior in high school, you're sort of getting a little bit bored, a little bit not challenged. And I was bright, you know, starting to get into a little bit more trouble than I really should. So the idea of uh, jumping into college early, mm -hmm. right, was I was like something that sort of emerged out of that, and I got super excited about it. Right, and uh, you know some of that, of course, is moving out of home. You're sort of, in some ways, you're a little bit trepidous about that, but also excited about it. Right, moving into college at a, you know, when you're uh, literally 16 years old, moving away from home and so on, and I was a pretty independent uh, soul, and I started taking classes at Lincoln Tech, and uh, sort of zoomed to the top of the class. And uh, it was like, wow, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at this stuff. I really like it, really enjoyed it. What was uh, the focus of the curriculum? It was l largely to be an electronics technician. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, with that, so, you know, your basic, uh, you know, engineering technician uh, type of uh, work, everything from Ohm's Law to basic programming uh, skills to, you know, fixing TVs and radios and so on. And, you know, at one point uh, I worked in a radio and TV station, you know, fixing, uh, you know, TV equipment. Uh, I even uh, did a little bit of part-time DJ work on, uh, at nights, you know, so it was the on-air voice for WFMZ in Allentown, Pennsylvania, giving the uh, weather and news at midnight, 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. on Friday and Saturday nights, right? You know, hey, as a, as a college student, you'll do just about anything to make a few bucks uh, at the time. But, uh, you know, really, really found uh, uh, enjoyment in the technology itself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sort of every class was just sort of like opening, a, you know, a, another layer of the onion. And, uh, you know, and, and the deeper I got into it, the more I enjoyed it. I remember some of the first programming I did. It was like, oh, wow. You know, uh, I was really quite excited about that, you know, building up some of your basic, uh, you know, control systems as well. I remember my, uh, you know, one of my uh, projects was building a single board computer uh, there, which uh, was, uh, you know, quite, you know, I entered it into a, a competition in Juan, you know, one of the, the local, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, compute competitions, but they couldn't decide if I was a college student or a high school student, right? <laughs> <laughs> which category to put you in, huh? Yeah. 
Yeah, it was a, it was a little bit humorous that uh, way. It was before some of the robotics competitions or you know some of those things that might be today. But uh, you know certainly loved it. And when Intel came recruiting, it was you know it was uh, like one of seven or eight uh, interviews uh, that I received at the time. Uh, and uh, everything else was uh, East Coast except for Intel. So what was the year you entered and graduated? Years yeah, years? so I entered in uh, 78, mm -hmm. right, uh, in uh, I think it was January of 78, and then I graduated in August of 79. So it was a, a two-year program, you know, really a 20-month program, and I accelerated it. You know, I was always trying to be this overachiever. Uh, so I finished the uh, program in uh, about uh, 18 months, and uh, Intel came uh, recruiting. Now, Intel has recruited there before? I mean, how did they find Lincoln Tech? And yeah, yeah, it was very exciting because, you know, Ron Smith, who was a pretty, you know, he's a PhD from Michigan. He was born and raised in Lancaster uh, County, uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, there was sort of an industry-wide shortage of technicians at the time, and Intel was in a, you know, one of these hyper-growth phases. So he volunteered to lead the first ever recruiting to Lincoln Tech. Mm. Right, it's the first time they ever came there, and uh, as he's uh, uh, and he interviewed a dozen of us, mm -hmm. right? And he was gonna he was interviewing a dozen. I think he was going to invite uh, eight, and they were hoping to hire like five or six uh, from our class. And I was number twelve of the interviewers the, of the interviewees to Ron uh, Smith. And uh, you know, Ron wrote this in his paper after he interviewed me. He said, "Smart, aggressive, arrogant." He'll fit right in, <laughs> and uh, got the invitation to come out uh, and uh, Were interview. Were there others that came also, or yeah, there was others that came out and interviewed, and three of us were uh, hired. Uh, four of us were hired uh, by uh, Intel. Two of the other guys became uh, my roommates, my first roommates when I moved oh. to California. You know, we thought we were pretty rich when we got those job offers from yeah, Intel, that. and then we saw what it cost to live in California, <laughs> and we realized we were pretty poor. Uh, so we got a house together very close to uh, Intel on Bowers Avenue, not far from Central Expressway, yeah. so sort of right in the middle uh, of the uh, town there. And it really was, I'll say, this, you know, this period of life we're looking back on, and it's like, you know, would I let my kids, right, uh, you know, leave home at 16 years old? Would I let my kids move to California at 18 years old? And I look back on it and say, no. <laughs> but yet my parents gave me the freedom when I was a you know, super independent uh, soul to move out here and uh, you know, begin a journey that, uh, you know, I thought I might be in California two years. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm an East Coast boy. And uh, then it was uh, 30 years later. So what was magical about Intel? What, what persuaded you that you really needed to do that? Well, a couple of things that really uh, uh, impressed me, and David A. Brown was my uh, first uh, manager. It was actually, I was either going to work in Ron Smith's organization or David's organization as a QA technician. But the thing that separated the Intel offer from all the other offers is they gave me tuition reimbursement to finish my bachelor's and uh, continue school here and gave me a, a super flexible work schedule to do that. So basically, as long as I uh, worked 30 or more hours a week and got B's or better, they would pay for my bachelor's, master's, PhD work. And uh, my parents were both eighth grade, uh, one room schoolhouse educated. So, and they just pounded into us from early ages, go to school, go to school, get your PhD. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I don't even think my mom knows what a PhD is, but it was, you know, one of those things you need to go, go get your PhD. So I was uh, pretty committed to continue past the, the two-year degree from Lincoln Tech. And uh, Intel clearly gave me the best offer to make that possible. And uh, so I moved out here in October of 79, and I started at uh, Santa Clara University in January of 80 uh, to start working on my bachelor. So I would go to classes in the morning, and then I would work in the afternoon and evening and study at night, and uh, was so uh, working full time and going to school full time. And uh, you know, it was a pretty unique experience. And then I continued into Stanford. Uh, being paid for by Intel. I remember my first uh, Santa Clara tuition bill. I had no money, right? I'm this poor farm kid. So I put it on a credit card and I lived in fear 
that I wasn't going to get a beer better because I couldn't afford to pay back. Right? To pay back. And the idea of carrying debt on my credit card was just this, you know, <laughs> you know, what will I do if I can't make the payment uh, at the time? Uh, so it caused me to work a little bit harder in that. Uh, Sounds first... like you got A's on all of those. Uh, yeah, courses. yeah, <laughs> it was uh, it was one of those. I remember I got a, a B on my first uh, midterm exam on one of my classes at Santa Clara, and I was just, <gasps> I'm going to fail. I'm not going to be able to pay. They're going to fire me. I'm going to have debt. What am I going to do? <laughs> but it certainly motivated me to study hard and work hard in uh, those uh, first classes. But that was part of what brought me to Intel. It was just the flexibility to go to school. I was actually excited you know, about working for a microprocessor company, and that was so intriguing at the time. And you know, the microprocessor, I mean, it wasn't a new invention, but it was still very new in terms of popularization and moving uh, into the industry. So it was a, it was so a thrilling time. You started at Intel in? 79. Seven, Seven, right after you graduated in August. Then. Yeah, yeah. August 79, began at Intel in October of 79, started my bachelor's at Santa Clara in uh, January of 80, and uh, you know worked uh, as a technician for two years uh, at Intel, and uh, was really a QA technician for microprocessors. And, uh, you know, that was, uh, you know, my first sort of taste of really getting close to, you know, what I consider the holy of holies, right, the microprocessor. What did you really learn in those two years? I mean, what did you learn some key lessons or, you know, about the company, about the technology? You know, what was that first two years of work? Yeah, you know, to me, it was just, you know, if if you could, you know, I was like a a sponge, right, Uh, you know, coming out of the desert. I mean, just every, you know, just learning so much and so excited. And, you know, you come with a work ethic from the farm, right? You know, to me, working on the farm was, uh, uh, you know, you really want to learn to work hard. And, you know, to me, if the horses weren't kicking me, the cows weren't biting me, I wasn't covered in hay dirt, hey, this is pretty good. Good, good right. day. Yeah. <laughs> and, boy, it's an air-conditioned building. You get paid overtime. Can you believe that? Right? You know, I was just like, wow. You know, i never been paid overtime in my life before uh, as a farm kid. And, uh, you know, so I was just manic, right? You know, I was either studying for Santa Clara or I was working at Intel. And, uh, you know, uh, Linda and I joke uh, that uh, we squeezed a year worth of dating into uh, three years. Because <laughs> what do they do? I worked and I went to school, you know, and I was loving it. And, uh, you know, I've always had a sort of a natural metabolism. I slept about five hours a night, you know, so I had more hours per day than most other humans do. So, you know, I was either working or going to school. And, you know, if I wasn't in school, I was setting overtime records at Intel because I loved it. And uh, so the work ethic aspects, you know, but also the first really learning some of the basics of programming, learning how to build right, you know, systems. Uh, I remember one of my first experiences uh, as a reliability technician at Intel was how can I go work with the design team? And again, the design team, oh, you know, they were like the high priests. Right. You know, it's like, oh, you know, that's really unique. And us lowly technicians in QA, you know, if we'd walk into the design department, you know, it was just like we were, you know, walking up the hill to Jerusalem or Mecca. Right. It was like it. And, uh, you know, and as the reliability technician, I was trying to run reliability experiments on microprocessors, how to make them reliable. How could we make that whole reliability process? And that's sort of what started to get me sucked into the design team. Right? And I started to do some reliability testing work about how can we design more of the reliability functions into the microprocessors, hmm. right? Which, you know, in uh, 1980 and 81, that was super early for that whole idea of design for testability, right? And built-in self-testing kind of circuits. You know, none of that was done at the time. So I began to study the whole topic of built-in self-test. The first paper I ever had published was on built, built-in self-testing uh, for microprocessors. And, uh, you know, and as I started to work with the design team, they were, you know, hmm, here's this bright young kid. What's he doing hanging around here? And I'm trying to get him to, you know, do these reliability tests and functions and, you know, build in these uh, capabilities. And they're sort of, you know, on the side, they're teaching me about chip design chip design, oh my gosh, I truly had gone to heaven, 
right? When they were starting to teach me about chip design, I just didn't think the world could get any better than that because I was designing the microprocessors of the future. It's just like, you know, boy, you know, I, I really uh, uh, was thrilled by that. And the idea of being able to be part of the design team for the 286, and then I was engineer number four in the 386, and it all started by saying, how can I start building self-test into those chips? How can we start building some of the reliability mechanisms into the chips uh, themselves, as opposed to just testing them after the fact, start to build the capabilities directly into the chip? And you know, the design team just sort of sucked me in, and you know, I had some pretty good computer skills, and they were sort of saying, well, why don't you run our Unix machines on the, uh, in your spare time as well, so we can get out of those terrible IT folk Right, uh, you know, and uh, so I was running a UTS uh, instantiation on the IBM mainframe for the design team, right? And they all hated the uh, CMS or the VAX environments that we had, so right, because those were run by IT. So I essentially, you know, became the system admin for the entire design team as well. And they would teach me how to design chips in their spare time, and I'm going to school to learn how to design at the same time. It was really a magical period in that way. Could you uh, talk, talk just a little bit more about um, that reliability and the self-test and that engineering, mm -hmm. that, that connection between, let's say, logical design and, and the physical reliability of these mm -hmm. electronic components? I'm not sure that everybody reading or, or watching will, will understand that. Yeah, and imagine, you know, and even a, you know, a chip like the uh, 386, yeah. you know, 282,000 transistors approximately, and uh, it was encapsulated in a uh, package that, uh, you know, if I, if I recall correctly, had 64 logical, uh, you know, uh, pins associated with it. So how do I wiggle 64 things to test 282,000 things. Because when you're testing a chip, right, you know, do all 282,000 work? Right, and you can imagine that it was designed to functionally do things, run buses, right, you know, signal addresses, you know, be able to stop, start, those type of things. But how do I make sure that there aren't defects laden inside of that 282,000? Right, and uh, you know the 286 had I think 127,000. The 486, uh, you know, was uh, 1 million uh, to uh, 1 million 204,486 transistors. You know, I added a few had to, to make be it the round. Absolutely, right? <laughs> I added a few to make it round to that. But these ratios of the amount of external visibility versus internal potential defects was an extraordinary problem. Right, and how do you wiggle the ch the, those pins to be able to make sure that all of those transistors are functioning properly? So this whole issue, and because you know, as Moore's law was now was now really in the sweet spot of Moore's law, you know, we were leaping from ten, you know, from thousands to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands to millions to tens of millions of transistors, and yet your I/O connectivity was going up, maybe generation by generation, by twenty percent. So that ratio of transistors to signaling pins to test things was becoming extraordinarily imbalanced. Mm. And in fact, uh, one of the papers I uh, uh, wrote was uh, that the cost of test was, you know, also as that problem was becoming worse, that, uh, you know, I basically, you know, demonstrated that just if you looked at the cost of test per chip, that the testing cost per chip was going to exceed the cost of the chip. Huh. Right, you know, in that you know, in that period of time, so that led to this whole topic, and it was a very active conversation at, a, at that period in the uh, early '80s in the industry. In fact, there were entire conference conferences dedicated to built-in self-test. Mm -hmm. How can we start building that into it? And it was uh, humorous because the test guys at the time, and this is you know the Teradynes and you know those kind of companies and Schlumbergers and so on were the testing companies at the time. You know, they were drooling. Wow, these test costs going up, you know, right? You know, because, you know, fit, you know we, absolutely, right? So I was the anathema, right, of the testing guys because I said, no way are we going to let the test cost per chip become more than the cost per chip. 
right? You know, we're not going to spend more testing it than we are in the package, the silicon, right, et cetera, associated with the chip. And that became the nexus of this idea of built-in self-test. And, you know, so we started to build, you know, instead of having a million functional transistors, right, let's take a few percent of them and dedicate them for testing because even a few percent of a million was far in excess of the number of pins mm. right you know i could dedicate 30 40 50,000 transistors to testing you know just you know 3% of the uh, you know the transistor count and if i could self test right or create automated test patterns or other mechanisms that could lower testing costs by a factor of 2 i more than paid for the 3% Right, that you might have put into uh, transistors inside of it to test it. And those transistors that you put in, right, all of a sudden became very, very powerful mechanisms. You could do diagnostics, you could do debugging, all sorts of other things emerge from that as well, which today, these are standard functions of chips today. Okay. You know, the idea that you can stop them, you can debug them, you can read out state associated uh, with them, you can run testing patterns. And in those earliest days, that was one of the, uh, you know, one of the breakthroughs. My first achievement award at Intel was, you know, built-in self-test uh, in the uh, 386. My first patent was in that area. You know, my first uh, article articles that I have published in that area. And in fact, I resigned from Intel at one point to go finish my PhD right, at Stanford, and it was going to be in this area of self-test, uh, test automation, formal proof of validation, uh, you know, formal proving of logic trees and you know, complete test coverage, et cetera. Wow. So, so oh, I'm sorry. No, I just wanted to finish up on, <clears throat> so I understand working with the design team to work on the testing problem, but in the quality problem, you know, the reliability problem. Mm -hmm. uh, did you also work with the uh, process engineering folks? Yes. And uh, and identify certain process uh, quality problems and that sort of thing? Yeah, and, you know, test coverage problems and quality problems were often very hard to separate the two. Mm -hmm. Right, you know, at that level, and you know, a lot of those things were, you know, you'd end up with funky transistor structures, right, that would be susceptible to certain process defects or process weaknesses, uh, as well. So interacted a lot with the uh, process technology uh, folks, uh, as well, and you know, just were wonderful days. Uh, and uh, we did uh, ion beam editing of the uh, mass of the 386. The first time that uh, ion beam was used to actually edit the mass so you didn't have to go through a full tape out reticle production process. So we went in and did it you know, specifically to address some reliability uh, issues in the fab. So I got bunny suited up, I'm in the fab, we're you know, running these uh, uh, you know, uh, etch patterns and you know, figuring out how to uh, address some of the early reliability issues of the 386. Uh, exactly that way. So, you know, it was just delightful days, and the first 386s were manufactured over at the Livermore Labs, right? Uh, you know, we had the, uh, you know, uh, Fab 3 for Intel was over in uh, Livermore at the time, and I remember uh, I and another guy uh, was written up in the Wall Street uh, Journal, the uh, midnight ride, he had a Mustang convertible, and we went over with the top down, listening to the Rolling Stones, we came back with the top up, right, holding the first 386 wafers, you know, you know, we thought, you know, it was like, a, you know, it was like, a, you know, like the wise men, it was like gold, frankincense, and myrrh, we had the uh, you know the first wafers and I remember everybody anxiously waiting because the debug team is ready to jump on these and get started on it and we of course were you know I mean we're young I'm 23 uh, years old at the time 20 you know something like that 24 years old so we're you know we decided to play a prank on the uh, team and we had some uh, wafers that were you know of other chips and we bring them into the conference room I trip we drop them on the floor we sort of end up falling on them breaking the wafers and <laughs> so, and I remember Jan Prock, one of the design managers in the 386, he starts getting down on the floor and trying to find a full, complete chip out of one of these wafers that were sort of marling up. And, you know, and he's, you just see him, he's like almost ready to cry, right? You know, my first 386. And, uh, and then uh, we bring the real wafers out and just, you know, everybody had a good laugh, even though I thought he really was going to have a heart attack at the time. I thought that <laughs> like was... Like you survived that, that little prank. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, you have to Oh, uh, what was I? Oh, it was just, um, so... In, with this, um, devoting some of the transistors to self-test, they are, in essence, you can, 
interrogate them so they can check all the other transistors. Is that roughly speaking the case? Yeah, and some of them, some of the transistors, you, you get very clever for how you can, you know, insert the transistors. And the first things were like, some of them were like uh, big uh, structures, like uh, memories, uh, PLAs, you know, programmable logic arrays. So, you know, how could you make sure that those were entirely tested? Right, so we did pattern generators, and you know, I remember uh, you know linear feedback uh, uh, registers, right, using polynomials that you could actually get very quickly, that you could generate patterns and be able to test results and be able to essentially uh, produce a, a hash, right, wow. of the results and be able to verify it. In other cases, it was to actually give you visibility where you can control state, you can inject things uh, into certain portions of the chip. You can see what it's really doing inside. You didn't have to guess. Right, you know, and again, in the microprocessor, you might be, you know, many clocks later until you can actually see some of the state. So if we could pause the microprocessor and then actually interrogate the state directly, very powerful, not just for testing, but also debugging the chip. Mm -hmm. Or those, many of those functions became software visible over time where software writers could use them as well and be able to interrogate and say, oh, how did I get to that state? You know, or that wasn't what I thought that protection register should have looked like. So those basic mechanisms became useful, not just for validating the chip, not just for the reliability of the chip, but not just the debug of the chip, but even turned into software visible uh, functionality as well. Hmm, that's fascinating. Um, well, could you, so as you're, as you're kind of um, Moving into the design group for the 286, is, um, could you describe um, sort of what that group looked like? You know, what, how many people was it? What sort of tools were they using? You know, how, how was that group designing the, the 286? Yeah, and it was, a, you know, this wonderful time of the design phase where a lot of the computer-aided design tools that we just take for granted today weren't invented yet. Right, so you're still, we're, you know, we're past the ruby lift place, right? So you could be putting polygons and you had mass designers who were laying out polygons. You could put those in the libraries and structures, but a lot of it was still hand done, right? There was a, a loose correlation between the logical design and the physical design. So you had to do a lot of work to correlate those two. And it was really before RTL was a formal right, mechanism to describe chips as a higher level language. Mm -hmm. It was before HDL or VHDL was invented uh, at that point. So you were largely were writing fairly rudimentary code to mimic what you saw in the logic. And then you had a process by which you take the logic and you know actually draw schematics. And those schematics would be handed to a mass designer who would then be translating those. And then you'd have tools that would be helping you Right, uh, you know, make sure that what actually ended up in the logical design, right, uh, into the schematic design, into the physical design of the chip, and then you had a whole separate tool set associated with uh, circuit integrity, circuit speed as well. So these were largely manual processes, and so a lot of my early successes in the design team were bringing CAD tools as we would know and love today, right, into the design process. Mm. And some of these were super rudimentary processes, just that you could essentially be, you know, capturing uh, logic traces and doing uh, correlations with RTL runs, right, where you could be, you know, running very basic patterns that the circuits would be functioning uh, properly. Uh, one of my early uh, uh, awards from Intel was I uh, helped to invent the first uh, we, we called it IHDL, Intel Hardware Description Language, mm. right? So we wrote the first, you know, HDL that was actually a synthesizable language, mm. right? We could actually synthesize logic so, you know, we could eliminate a lot of the errors that might be introduced by translating a higher level description into logic. Uh, we also created, helped to create the first synthesis system uh, as well, and that was part of the 486 where we actually synthesized it into logic, not just you know validated it uh, as well. 
but uh, you know, today you look back on that and you'd sort of say, "Wow, you know, you guys were like, you know, using uh, right uh, uh, hammers and chisels out of stone compared to the tools that we have now." It was quite rudimentary in comparison. You know, you were wrestling with computers, right? You know, to get them to stay up and run because many of these jobs had enormous memory spaces, much larger than the computers could run uh, at the time. Uh, and uh, you know, one of my favorite favorite stories. Uh, in that phase of the career, my, my career was actually at the late in the 386 design, uh, where I was in charge of taping out the 386, okay. right, which is assembling that big database. And today it's a trivial database, but at the time it was a massive database for the size of computing that was available. And I had to give an update to the executive staff of Intel. So here I am, you know, I'm 23, 20 years old, something like that at this point, 24 years old, and uh, I'm presenting to Gordon Moore, Moore's Law, Robert Noyce, the integrated circuit, Andy Grove, right? You know, and these are, <laughs> you know, they're in the front row. Here I am, I'm updating them on the chip assembly of the 386, and, uh, uh, you know, as that project is going. And you know what I did? I chewed them out because the computers were not stable. So here I am, this little 23-year-old precocious brat, right, who's chewing out the gods of the industry, Andy, Robert, and Gordon, right? You have to fix these computers if I'm gonna get my chip out the door. And it was like, wow, you know, you know, and I was so, you know, I was working so hard. I was so busy and, you know, trying to get this thing done and computers were crashing and jobs weren't finishing uh, point. And a few days later, Andy calls me up, right? The phone rings. I pick up the phone and I said, who is it? Right. And the voice comes back, Andy. Andy who? And, uh, you know, he says, Andy Grove. Right. You know. I'm down here, you know, and uh, you know, I, you know, just sort of stammered and you know, shocked and so on like that. He starts shelling me with questions. I was impressed by your presentation the other day. Well, I thought I chewed you out, but anyway. <laughs> and uh, what do you read? What are you studying? What's your next career that you want to, you know, job? You know, how, you know, what's the next job that you want? You know, all these. You know, career and aspirational questions. All I wanted to do is get my chip out the door. And uh, he said, those are lousy answers. Be in my office in a week with better ones. And that began a mentoring relationship that lasted over 30 years, mm. right? You know, with one of the gods of the industry. So it was one of those most unique experiences that emerged out of that early period of uh, my career of wrestling with CAD, you know, the, before we had CAD tools, creating them and computers and so on, began a relationship that I consider one of the most important of my career and life. So how did you, you were working in this QA responsibility it's interacting with the design team. Who, who moved you over? Did 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 you, did somebody say you know, call up your boss and say, hey, we need him over here, or you just started spending more time over there? How did, how yeah. did that process happen? And yeah, uh, yeah, the the two at the end of the two eighty six mm -hmm. uh, project, uh, uh, Jim Slager. Right, uh, who was uh, you know well-known guy at Intel at the time, one of the early design managers. You know, he was in charge of the last steppings of the th of the 286, and he became one of the he and Jan Prock became the first two right uh, design leads, a logic guy and a circuit guy. At the time, Jim was the logic guy and Jan was the circuit guy, and uh, so they were finishing up the 286. I started to work with them, and uh, you know they uh, saw this uh, young, aggressive, arrogant, uh, smart, uh, computer savvy uh, guy, and uh, they just sucked me into the design team. Mm -hmm. And uh, literally, you know, one day I was the QA technician working on the 286, and the next day I was a dweeb design engineer, entry level, didn't know anything about design, uh, working for uh, Jim Slager, and he brought me over to be part of the 386 design team, and I was engineer number four in the 386. I was wondering if you could, uh, you know, there's an interesting relationship between, well, maybe you could characterize, there's another big microprocessor project going on at the same time, right? The mm -hmm. 432? Yes, yes. Which was, as I understand it, sort of like the computer scientist's dream sort of shift. Yes, yeah. Um, and so uh, could you, uh, 
but as we know in retrospect, the 386 became so imp critically important for mm -hmm, Intel mm -hmm. as a company. Yeah. Could you talk about the story of the relationship between those projects and just oh, how it, it appeared from your vantage point? Yeah, it was just a stunning time uh, uh, in the industry because, you know, the 286 and, you know, at the time, this idea of instruction set compatibility was a fairly nascent idea, right? Where sort of, you know, and, you know, there was limited, you know, outside of some of the things that IBM had done, right? Pretty much every machine was designed with a new instruction set, mm -hmm. right? You know, you're sort of jumping from 8-bit to 16-bit to 32-bits and so on. So, you know, this idea of instruction set compatibility and the business plan, right, there's a formal business plan for this at Intel, that the 386 was a sort of a stopgap that would have a fairly short lifetime, hmm. right, and it would be usurped by the grand new architecture of the 432, right? And we were working on the dumb machine, the 386, and all of the really smart architects and designers were working on the cool machine the 432, and that was up in uh, Oregon, uh, was the center of the, 40, uh, of the 432. And, you know, we, we were the dumb folk working on the uh, uh, 386 down in Santa Clara. And this was tribal warfare at its finest, right? The teams hated each other. Yeah, I mean, it was, you know, incredible, the battles that were going on between us, and we'd fight over computer resources and ideas and whatnot. And uh, I remember one day, Jim Slager comes into my office, and he hands me the book, The Soul of a New Machine, the Tracy Kidder book. And he says, read it, you're living it. <laughs> right? And we were. Right, you know, because if you read, you know, remember the book, the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, book, it was the two design teams, the North Carolina design team, and you know, how they were competing uh, with each other, and you know, which one would win. And sort of day by day, it became visible that the 3D6 was more prominent, hmm. right? That it wasn't a real stopgap. Well, it's going to be a little bit longer, and the 432 was a complex design, so it was slipping. So the role that the 3D6 was playing was getting bigger. And we were told that, well, to help make the transition to the 432 easier, you need to make the buses the same so that we can build boards for the 3D6 and then we can drop the 432 into the same buses. So then we had the bus wars, right, as we were fighting because we had to have these. And the bus, it was a transactional bus architecture for the 432, which, you know, a basic uh, address data response bus in the 386. We looked at this like, this is like from Mars. Why would we put this complexity? But, you know, the management team decided this was what you had to do. So we had this little stealth project going on. And the bus unit was like we, we made all of our interfaces into the bus unit very clean and precise so that we could get rid of that complex bus because every day their bus logic got bigger and bigger and bigger. It was consuming more and soon the bus unit, right, uh, from the 432 that we had to take was almost bigger than the rest of the chip. So we had this little stealth project going on, on the side uh, that was a nice, simple address data bus architecture that, you know, we had in mind a pipeline data bus architecture. And at some point, you know, we just stopped working on that one, right? Well, when you guys get it done, you know, send, send us, the, uh, us the design files and, you know, we'll think about, you know, how we plug it in. But we agreed on the interfaces to go do it. And the project just kept getting more complicated because the architects were, you know, these object models and security models and, you know, it was, uh, you know, architects gone wild, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, really, you know, as history has now shown, it was just uh, so extraordinarily complex that the design never came, right, to uh, fruition. There was the big partnership with Siemens uh, that Intel formed at the time to bring systems together associated with this. And it's sort of like every day the project got bigger, more complex, and later, right? And inside of that, the importance of the 386 became more and more important, right, as that became. And all of a sudden, you know, the role of the 386, so that was sort of, you know, battle one, right, of the 386 was the 386 versus the 432. But then battle two became the IBM battle. Because 32 bits, wow, that's much too powerful for a personal computer. 
you know, IBM had decided that 32 bits was only suitable for mini computers. So, and you know, at that time, this was before the PC compatible era had begun. So the second battle was who was going to introduce a personal computer using the 386, right? And it's before you know, Compaq was anything, right? You know, Dell wasn't even an idea yet, right? <laughs> right? And uh, you know, all of this uh, era of the industry is waiting on IBM. And what is IBM doing with the 386? Nada. They are stalling because they had good profits at that 32-bit level. And everybody knows that 32 bits is much too powerful to put on some desktop, you know, running some personal computer operating system like MS-DOS, right? You know, clearly 16 bits is enough forever for that. And uh, so, you know, as we're working on the 386, you know, we're starting to, you know, we're taking trips to Houston and, you know, trying to get the compact guys and taking trips to Boca Raton and trying to move the IBM guys. And every visit to IBM seems like, uh, you know, we've just mired into the, uh, you know, the sand pits, right? You know, it's like, where's the, ch you know, where are the designs, you know, why aren't you guys giving us feedback and, you know, so on. And then, of course, you know, the day that defined the industry was, when uh, Compaq uh, said, hey, we're going to introduce the uh, 386 into a personal computer and we're not going to wait for IBM, right? And, uh, and as that started to gain momentum, and then IBM rushed to be the first one to market with the 386. And uh, then the doors were wide open, right? The personal computer industry was unleashed from the IBM, Boca Raton, we're going to control it, manage the industry, we own all the buses, the intellectual property, and the race began, right, uh, into tomorrow. And, uh, you know, it really was a stunning period. And, you know, looking back on it, you had just no idea that you were writing history, mm. right? You know, you're getting on a plane and going to Houston, and, you know, they're coming along, but we're all, you know, what's IBM going to do? Can we actually fork from IBM? What if they do it a different way, right? You know, are they going to sue us? And, you know, all these crazy things are going on uh, uh, at that period of time. And then out of that came the personal computer industry with open interfaces, with standard buses, until they attempted to get things back under control with microchannel, mm. right? Because, of course, we can do a better job than those stupid PC guys. And that became the second great battle. Right, and out of that came PCI bus and industry standards that weren't controlled, you know, by uh, IBM and Microsoft innovations and software, and the whole Wintel generation just explodes in innovation and creating of new uh, industry standards. So, can we put some timelines on these? We sort of rushed through. The, when did you join the 286 team? When did that? And then when did you then join the 386 team? Yeah, so I, I joined Intel in 79. Mm -hmm. uh, I joined the 286 team uh, in early 81. Okay. Right, so not quite two years as a QA technician sort of kicking around the design team. And uh, then the 386 uh, formally got underway in late 81. Right, uh, at that point. And, you know, that was about a four year project. Right. That was very quick. I mean, you sort of moved through those very Yeah, quickly. yeah, it was and pretty quick. Yeah, so it was less than two years that, you know, I was into the 386 team. And, uh, you know, uh, from my time uh, starting at Intel, and truly, you know, I thought, you know, I had just gone to heaven when I joined the design team. You know, it's just like, you know, designing the future microprocessors of the and planet. were you doing logic design? Were you doing architectural design? Were you doing, cert what level of design were you in? I was mostly doing logic design. Mm -hmm. Right, it was where I was, but late in the project, and you know, being one of these uh, overachiever, manic worker kind of guys, you know, I had finished. I had the D unit, right, uh, the data unit. So I had the ALU. My first, uh, you know, I did the uh, you know ALU. I got a patent on uh, the you know non uh, uh, non regular carry look ahead adder on the 386, which was a big circuit design uh, problem, and got that done. And then I did the I unit. Right, the instruction decoder uh, unit. Then I did the test logic for the complex uh, protection modes of the uh, uh, 386 uh, as well. And then I was in charge of uh, uh, chip assembly and uh, tape out uh, uh, for the 386. Uh, so I did some, some circuit design, did some physical design, but most of my work was in the logic uh, area. 
So it was at the end of the 386 in this sort of tape out blizzard that you had this encounter with Andy and uh, yes. things yeah, took yeah. a dramatic turn, I presume, yeah. with that. Yeah, that was sort of the career-defining uh, uh, moment. And, you know, we launched the 386 in uh, uh, 85, so this is late 83, early 84, when, you know, we're working on that uh, tape-out phase of the chip and had my first real encounters with Andy Grove, and my career began to take a very different turn than I ever respected, uh, ever expected as a result. Well, I can imagine that, you know, a maniacal work ethic <coughs> And, um, you know, that sort of public confrontation about a problem that you're having, both of which w would have appealed directly to his yeah. style of operation. Yeah, and, you know, Andy was one of those guys where he just didn't care if you were, right, uh, a head of state or an entry technician. If you were smart and had data, he was interested in interacting with you. And if you could, you know, as I'd say, you had to be smart. Right, you know, he had just this, you know, he had no time for fools, right? You had to have data, right? You know, defend your perspective and a point of view. And if you could do that, he didn't care what level of the hierarchy that you were, right? You know, and uh, it was just incredible. Uh, and he was intense, focused. And to be in a room with Andy and be quiet was one of the worst things that you could do. Why are you consuming oxygen when I could have somebody else in that chair who actually was contributing with data and points of view to the conversation? And, you know, he was a, a very, you know, confrontational oriented because he felt, you know, in that, right, you know, conflict came better ideas, better understandings, right? If he'd ask you a question that you couldn't give a good answer to, oh, then I know the next five questions I'd ask you, you were a waste of time. Right, because if you couldn't defend that one, you know, have you really thought about, worked hard to understand the next three or four? So to not have good answers for two or three questions in a row to Andy, oh my gosh, right? <laughs> so how did that then morph into you then became, what was your position at the 486? What was that next step and how did yeah. Andy affect that? Yeah, so I became, uh, uh, and the design team sort of birthed me into being the first architect of the 8046. Mm -hmm. So I was architect number one, sort of that early product planner, uh, architect uh, design phase, basic microarchitecture. So I was uh, engineer number one in the 8046. Uh, became uh, part of the design team as we started to grow the de design team. Other people started to come along uh, the design uh, team. And uh, then I resigned for the second time from Intel. What was the first time? It was when I uh, was in the middle of the 386, I was going to go work on my PhD at okay, Stanford. that was in the middle of the 386. Right, to, to do my... And how did uh, that turn around? Yeah, and uh, that one was, uh, was, it was interesting because, you know, I resigned in frustration, right, that the design management and teams, they weren't taking the steps they needed to do to organize us for success. I was going to go work for IBM, and they were immediately going to put me as part of the PhD program. Right, uh, they had a very lucrative program uh, to go do that. So uh, the uh, as a result of that, the 386 team was restructured, right? And to me, they you know there's a number of things they just had to do if we're going to get the chip out the door and be successful. So my first resignation sort of resulted in the reorganization of the 386 team, and obviously we got the 386 done. Mm -hmm. So that was it. And then uh, I uh, left the 486. Uh, to, you know, I had finished, was uh, well in my master's program now uh, at Stanford. And again, my mom said, get your PhD. So I was going to go get my PhD and was ready to, you know, uh, applying for, and John Hennessy was going to be my thesis advisor oh, at Stanford. Wow. Uh, and uh, so uh, he was my master's advisor and was going to become my PhD thesis advisor at Stanford. So I resigned from Intel, and I was, you know, uh, early architect, and the project was going uh, uh, well and getting underway. And Andy Grove came to me, and he says, you can go there and learn in the simulator, or you can stay here and fly the jet. And he offered me the job of being the 46 design manager. Mm. So here I was at 25 years old, you know, 24, 25 years old. You know, I'd been architecting the 46 for a year, was ready to go do my PhD program at Stanford, and Andy made me the design manager for the 46. And, uh, you know, at that point in time, nobody in the 46 team was younger than me. Right? You know, there's, you know, 100 engineers working on it. I'm the youngest person on the design team. 
which, you know, in retrospect, it's like, would you put the youngest guy, the least experienced manager in charge of the chip? But, you know, Andy really saw that leadership. He had been mentoring me for a couple of three years at this point uh, in time, and he put me in the role of the 486 design manager, which I went from being the first architect of the chip to becoming the design manager, you know, for the chip and really, you know, hiring, firing, assembling the team, laying out uh, those uh, strategies and plan to bring the 486 to fruition. And part of the reason that Andy made me uh, the design manager was, became the second battle. We had the 432 battle. The next <coughs> battle became the risk sys battle. Right, and if you go back to 85, 86, 87, this is when the risk, right, uh, doctrine was emerging in force uh, in the industry. You know, CIS versus risk, right? You know, this idea of complex instruction flows versus, uh, you know, highly optimized uh, simple pipelines move that complexity into the software systems that fled fed the uh, pipelines, and there was a whole flurry of risk chips that were emerging in the uh, so industry. From John Hennessy, your, your advisor, advisor right? <laughs> yeah, well, we'll get back to that one in a second, right? You know, the extraordinary story there. So, you know, this, uh, you know, emerging, but we also had one at Intel called the 860, mm. right? And there's the 860 risk chip, right? Because that's the future. Right, you know that clunky x86 thing. You're not going to be able to keep up. You know, you know all these graphs were showing how sys chips were going to flatten out. You weren't going to be able to, you know, keep up with Moore's law and you know all those systems. So once again, I was working on the clunky old boring compatible chip. Right, but. Andy, right, you know, and I were convinced. And at that point, you know, the dogma of instruction set compatibility was deeply ingrained inside of me, right? And, you know, part of the reason when I, re when I left Intel, it was like, hey, you know, everybody wants to go build these risk chips. You know, you're not investing in the 486. You know, that's clearly the right thing to go do. I'm going to go finish my PhD at Stanford. My mom wants me to get that done anyway. And uh, so I resigned. And Andy, uh, as I said, he makes me the 486 design manager in part because I believe so deeply that instruction set compatibility in the 486 was the future uh, at that point. And uh, so many of the other leaders at Intel at the time were convinced, right, that the risk dogma was correct. And I was convinced it was dead wrong. And I remember I had a debate uh, with John Hennessy where he said, you know, risk chips will never break two clocks per instruction. Right, you know that you know you you could not you know it's like this fundamental barrier that he had theorized, right? Uh, that uh, you can never you know get you know the instructions per clock lower than that. There's just too much complexity in the, in the sys, sys chips. In the sys chips, right? And that wrist chips, hey, they're going to go right down to one clock per instruction. This is going to be uh, elegant. This is before any of the superscalar machines had started to emerge as a uh, uh, expectation. And when I had this argument with John, I knew in the back of my mind that I was already running simulations at 1.8, mm -hmm. right? And he's telling me it can't break 2.0. And uh, so now we had him as my master's thesis advisor. I'm the design manager and architect of the 486, right? I'm about to enter the PhD program. He's Mr. Risk, yeah. right? Because he's now starting MIPSCO, right? Uh, the, uh, you know, in his own, he's just published his book Right uh, at this point, you know, the seminal uh, computer architecture book is coming out, the first version of it. And we had a mutual friend that found out that we had Mr. Sisk work, working for Mr. or as a student of Mr. Risk, the commercial versus the university, the old versus the new, teacher versus student. We had public debates of John and Pat. And, uh, you know, and uh, Bear Stearns had a big investor conference, you know, a couple thousand people in the audience, and it was a public debate of risk versus CISC at the time, of John versus Pat. And I start laying out the dogma of instruction set compatibility, architectural coherence, you know, how software always becomes the determinant of any computer architecture being developed. Software follows, silic, uh, uh, follows, uh, all right, instruction set, instruction set follows, uh, Moore's Law, right? And, uh, you know, unless you're 10x better, right? And John, you're not 10x better. You're lucky if you're 2x better. 
Moore's Law will just swamp you over time because architectural compatibility becomes so dominant, right, in the adoption of any new uh, computer platform. And, uh, you know, this is one x86. There was no server x86s, no clouds at this point uh, in time. And John and I got into this big public debates, and it was so popular. Uh, microprocessor report, you can go back and see, right, the verbatim debates of John and Pat uh, that we had was published in those uh, archives. And we repeated the debate, I think, three other times uh, that we had it. It was so popular at the time, Mr. Risk versus Mr. Sys. So the, so the claim wasn't that the <coughs> Sys could beat the risk or keep up to it exactly, but but the uh, other overwhelming factors would make it the winner in the end. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, and the, was the, the argument was based on uh, three, three fundamental tenets. You know, one is that the gap was dramatically overstated and it wasn't an asymptotic gap, mm -hmm. right? You know, there was a complexity gap associated with it, but you know, you're gonna make a leap up and that the Cisco architecture could continue to benefit from Moore's law. Right, and that Moore's law would continue to carry that forward, right? You know, based on simple ones, you know, a number of transistors to attack the cis problems, you know, frequency of transistors, you get performance uh, for free. And if that gap was in a reasonable frame, you know, if it's less than 2x, hey, in Moore's law's term, you know, that's less than a process generation, right? right? So, and a, and a process generation is two years long, right? So, how long does it take you to develop new software? Right, you know, porting operating systems, creating optimized uh, compilers, you know, you know, if it's less than five years, right, you know, you're doing extraordinary in building new software systems. So if that gap is less than five years, I'm going to crush you, John, because you cannot possibly establish a new architectural framework for which I'm not going to beat you just based on Moore's law and the natural aggregation of the computer architecture benefits that I can bring in a compatible machine. And, right, of course, I was right and he was wrong, right? And now, as I remember, we had, I had the oral history with John Crawford, mm -hmm. and he said, what, my interpretation of his remarks were that you found ways to embed a good number of the CIS, uh, risk ideas within the CISC architecture. Yeah. And so that you could close the gap that way, that it wasn't a pure risk versus CIS, that you could actually take the some of the core risk ideas and, and, and embed them in the CISC. Yeah, framework. very much so. And, you know, John deserves a little bit of, you know, John and I became partners, right? You know, in the, in the late 386 days, right? We started to work together in the early days of the 486 and John was much more of a software architecture guy and I was much more of a logic microarchitecture mm -hmm. kind of guy. So we had a great uh, partnership, but the comments there are exactly correct. Because the belief was, and you know, the 386 was about uh, four clocks per instruction, mm -hmm. right? You know, which when you're looking at a, uh, right, a optimized risk pipeline where they were demonstrating in simulation 1.5, 1.6 clocks per instruction, ooh, that's a pretty big gap, mm -hmm. right? But the 486 was very much a risky-like internal pipeline mm -hmm. where we could actually suck a lot of the complexity into the instruction decoder and present to the rest of the machine very risky-like instructions in a very pipeline fashion. Mm -hmm. So we were sort of able, exactly as you say, sort of to pull the risk ideas and implement them inside of the microarchitecture of the machine, never exposing the architecture of the instruction set externally to any of those optimizations that we did internally, but in that be able to be compatible from the software perspective and benefit from some of those uh, best ideas. And then, you know, the next, and that was, you know, this optimized pipeline machine was the core of the risk genre uh, at that time. And then the next big step was moving into superscalar. We actually started to do parallel execution. And then the next big microarchitectural step was out of order execution, right? Right, so those are sort of the big generations where you went from a true CISC machine to a highly pipeline machine, very risky, to a super scalar machine you started to do in parallel, and then you started to execute out of order instructions where you actually started to, you know, essentially retire machines as opposed to issue instructions. And that was sort of the major x86 architectural uh, progression. Uh, Gordon Moore one time was des described it as kind of the, the two approaches eventually converged. You yeah. know, risk became mm -hmm. more complicated and, yeah. and yeah. kind of uh, CISC became more risk-like. And so really they 
approached yeah. one because, another. Because, you, you know, what happened was, fair? you know, this, uh, this idea of instruction set compatibility, because as soon as the risk guys put their mark on the wall, they were all of a sudden bound by the same things. Well, they couldn't go changing, you know, as they went from MIPS code generation one to two to three, they couldn't just willy-nilly be changing the microarchitecture because they had to run some of that old code. So all of a sudden they became bound by the same instruction set compatibility limitations. So they became more sysky, right? Exactly like Gordon said, and we were finding clever ways to hide the instruction set complexity early in the machine right, and the instruction decoder and so on, and making the rest of the machine look more risky uh, in that sense. And, you know, so the ideas really sort of did start to meld together uh, over time. And, you know, what was an enormous religious debate, right, of the right way to build microarchitectures in that 85 to, you know, 92, 3, 4 period, right, you know, eventually gave way to just an architectural battle. Mm. Right. Um. It, uh, it sounded to me like when you were describing the work you were doing on the 386, you could, <clears throat> you could almost, in a quick summary, kind of say, like, uh, making developments and using software to design microprocessors. Mm -hmm. Like, that mm -hmm. was a big um, thrust of what you were involved with. When you kind of came back for the 486 and were in charge of that project, was this the case where you were, it was uh, even more of that, of learning how to use software and big computing resources to, to really effectively design this new microprocessor? Yeah, very, very much so. It was a continuation. And, you know, it was one of these things where, you know, as I, you know, as I was a student at, uh, you know, Santa Clara, I mean, there was the EEs and then there were the software guys, right? And those were pretty separate disciplines. Mm. Right, you know, you're over here using oscilloscopes and <laughs> you, you know soldering irons, and they're over here, you know, programming. The, the the disciplines were actually quite separate from each other. And what we were observing was that we were using far more computer science. In fact, all of our hardware silicon design time was spent doing software. Mm. So we were very quickly saying, how can we start using more of those software for CAD tools and automation and tests and so on? Because we were spending all of our time on the computer, you know, when was the last time any of us were in the lab, right? You know, oh, okay, we need to go few, run a few circuit experiments, right? But the vast majority of the time was being done in the computer. So how can we do more computer automation? And uh, one of the innovations late in the 386 design cycle was computer, uh, you know, synthesis. Right, where we could actually do logic synthesis directly, which allowed us to push the logic design much later in the design process. Just give me a block on the chip and I'll drop in, right, uh, you know, the synthesized logic gates uh, into that. We became much more automated in terms of place and route uh, technology for big blocks, for circuit uh, automations. And so many of my early patents and, you know, innovations and awards at Intel were in exactly that area of how can we automate uh, synthesize, uh, software eyes, more of the chip design uh, process itself. And of course, that gave way to then extraordinary architectural innovations as well. Does this relate, and forgive my ignorance about it, but um, in the kind of VLSI design world, like Carver Mead's ideas about silicon compilers, is, mm -hmm. is the, does that relate to what you're talking about here, about synthesis? I'm not, I don't know that I personally am following it exactly right. Yeah, and much of uh, what Carver Mead really did was, you know, how do you turn a gate into polygons that go onto the silicon? Okay. Right, so it's absolutely the same generic idea, but he's actually lower in the stack. I get it. Right, because here, right, if I say make it a NAND gate, how do you go create a NAND gate with the polygons of, you know, of uh, contacts and metal wires and polysilicon layers and wells, right? You know, that was really where Carver Mead, and it was fundamental work uh, at the time. Today, we take that for granted, but when Carver Mead did that, that was like revelations of how to generate early VLSI designers, okay. right? That you could demystify. You didn't have to have a PhD in thermal physics to know how to put a gate down, right? And that's what Carver Mead did in a very fundamental uh, way for the industry. Some of these later synthesis were how do you take a high level description, something that looks like a program, 
and turn them into logic gates. Mm -hmm. And then Carver's work was very much how do you turn logic gates into polysilicon uh, layers. And then the other big question is then how do you make them performant? How do you have circuit designs and, you know, and now, you know, getting a signal across a chip, right, you know, and power optimization. I mean, you know, these are tens of millions, now billions of transistors that are operating in uh, harmony with each other. Okay, thank you. Um, so Andy put you in place as the design manager, the youngest man of the team. There must have been some fallout from that. You know, it was interesting. Bold move. <laughs> you know, it was bold. And as a young manager, you know, I had a lot to learn. I look back on it. It's like I'm stunned that anybody stayed <laughs> in the team. But sort of after we got over that gestation phase, as I'm sort of figuring out how to be a manager, you know, for it, and the design team grew to be uh, uh, about 120 people uh, in the core design team. We did the project. We worked together as a team for four years, and we only had three people leave the team in four years because we became passionate. Mm -hmm. And I think in that sense, the 860 and some of this risk rhetoric, I mean, we were going to deliver a high performance compatible 486 machine that changed the industry. You know, the team became so committed, you know, almost with a religious uh, fervor to doing exactly that. And the team became so united against that cause, despite this uh, young, green, inept management, right, uh, uh, leader, we were passionate about that goal. And as I say, for four years, the team was so extraordinarily united. I remember we enjoyed, uh, we had a softball team. We played in the Intel Softball League in the summer, and we were, you know, there as a team, all showing up, even people who didn't go on the field. You know, I remember we had these, uh, you know, uh, some of the folks from India who knew how to play cricket but not baseball. So we're teaching them how to run bases and everything like that. It was hysterical. And, you know, the 46 picnics that we had, you know, everybody shows up with family I and mean, it was you know we created a, an extraordinary uh, team rapport uh, and a commitment to success that despite you know some of those we were going to get that chip out the door and obviously it, we did and it was an extraordinary successful period of the industry so the other thing I'm curious about is that um, you sort of started you your work in the 286 and even 386 was sort of logic and physical design mm -hmm. at some point you were an architect of one of the most complex computer systems being built. Where did you pick up that knowledge? Was this working with Hennessy? Was this sort of osmosis going along with their mentors sort of bringing you in? Because mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a much bigger step to from the world of logic and yeah. to yeah. the complexities of uh, out of order instructions and those sorts of things. And clearly, uh, you know, as I was rising in uh, management roles and responsibilities, you're sort of doing less of the work yourself. You're much more about hiring and bringing those people uh, into place. It's clearly where people like John Crawford became more, you know, he was, you know, a compiler, operating system kind of guy. So bringing that, you know, we were bringing other people into the team. I'm scurrying as fast as I possibly can. You know, I'm taking uh, operating system classes and compiler classes at Stanford and you know, running up the stack and learning, uh, you know, computer languages and some of these architectural techniques. It was, you know, this extraordinary period for me personally because literally I'm taking uh, master's and PhD classes at Stanford by day and designing chips by night, right, and uh, really learning it. So it was really all of the above. And many of these architectural principles, uh, you know, that we take almost for granted today weren't invented yet. You know, some of them we were doing by the seat of our pants at the time, right? right? And, uh, you know, that now have become highly rigorous, right, in the uh, understandings that went behind it. And, you know, we made some extraordinary choices and some mediocre ones uh, in the uh, process. Uh, and, uh, you know, in that, uh, you know, it really was, uh, uh, and I think you find that in almost all great, uh, I'll say, technical achievements. Right, that the team is so focused on getting a goal done, right, that you're you know forced to be creative at these different pieces. Oh well, we don't know how compilers are going to handle that. Well, let's just go write you know a code generator tonight. Oh, I don't know who knows how to write a code generator. Oh, you did one in college for Pascal. Great, you know, go get one done. Right, I need it tomorrow. 
right? You know, when we're starting to, okay, we're doing code generation. Oh, okay, we, we have to get some instruction set data. You know, what's the latency of jumps and how often do we take jumps and how often are they conditional or not conditional? Oh, I don't know. Let's go, right, start crawling through programs and let's go, you know, build a code set analyzer. So boom, you know, we'll have that done next week. And, you know, pr these things that today you would take for granted and uh, hey, they were pretty crude and ugly at the time, you know, but we figured out quite quickly how to start, you know, getting some of those uh, capabilities uh, uh, in place to guide the uh, chip design. And, and as I say, people like John Crawford and some of the others who came along from the software side. I remember some of the great Microsoft debates we had, right? Because Microsoft was very quickly as well, you know, seeing the uh, uh, extraordinary, you know, because, you know, you know, at some points it wasn't clear if x86 was going to win, right? So Microsoft had projects that they were doing, you know, trying to figure out, you know, you know, where else do I port MS-DOS for? What else do I write software for? You know, so on. And I remember some of the early meetings that we had with Bill Gates and some of the other architects from Microsoft, because they were basically coming in and saying that we were stupid chip guys who had no idea how to build instruction set computers, right, you know, that were performance. So, you know, they certainly brought ideas to the table. Uh, but I remember my first meeting with Bill Gates, and, you know, this is in the uh, 3D6 uh, uh, time, and I'm now, you know, rising up. I'm becoming a pretty, right, uh, capable uh, chip guy at the end of the 3D6. And Bill Gates comes, and he has this pile of simulations that Microsoft engineers had run, right? He throws them on the table, and he starts chewing us out on the 3D6 design team. Right, and I'm sitting here, it's like, this is my chip, right? You know, it's like, you are calling my baby ugly, right? How dare you, <laughs> right? <laughs> right at the time, and we're just starting the first 46 design work at the time, and I'm in charge of that, right, uh, uh, for it. And I start arguing with Bill because some of his data was bad, and he starts arguing back. Right. And again, you know, I'm here and Bill Gates is here and, you know, a very technical guy, very capable guy. And we're going back and forth and back and forth. And soon there's, you know, 20 people in the room, but there's only two. Yeah. Right. Pat versus Bill. Right. And we are arguing at each other and explaining why he's stupid and he's explaining why I'm stupid and we're back and forth and so on. After about an hour of this, we got to a natural breaking point uh, in the conversation. And the senior Intel guy comes to me at the time. He says, Pat, I don't think we'll be needing you for the rest of the meeting. <laughs> I was furious. <laughs> he was calling my baby ugly. How dare you have the audacity to do that? But, you know, out of, I say, some of that creative tension, also clearly Microsoft had a role to play mm -hmm. in some of these early uh, trade-offs. And even though they were fiery and, I, you know, people were, will romanticize the Wintel, right, you know, partnership, you know, there was nothing romantic about it. You know, this was raw intellect, who is going to be the biggest dog in the industry, who has the best ideas, right? You know, we would fight more than we would uh, partner with each other, but out of the fight became better ideas, better solutions, you know, uh, sustainable uh, technologies. Yeah, the, it, because the, in some ways there's um, uh, a divergence of interest between the two sides, even for, uh, in, not just even in a business sense, but a technological sense about, you know, the desire to push forward the capability and the capacities and what the microprocessors are embodying and, you know, what Microsoft would desire for, you know, spreading the use of their mm -hmm. software. Did you, and that was a kind of a creative tension. Yeah. Or just you know, a tension. I, <laughs> I sort of viewed it that we were going down this road together. Right. It was like two porcupines going down the road together. And, you know, I mean, we're on the same road. You know, we are out to create the personal computer industry. Right. We didn't know it when we started the journey together, but that's what we're out to create. And that personal computer industry would redefine all of computing. Right. It would eliminate mini computers, make mainframes irrelevant. It would enable them. But we didn't. None of us knew that at, at the time. But we're going down this road together. The industry is pulling us. We're racing with the industry, the ideas, the competitive architectures, the competing companies into it. And then we would squabble on that road and fight and yell and we'd run away from each other and throw stuff at each other. And then we realize, oh, we're still going down the same road together. And then we get back together as we're running and then, and then a fight would break out. 
right? And the porcupines would yell at each other and, you know, so on. And we'd poke and squabble and so on. And then we'd figure out, well, we're still going down the same road together. And we'd, you know, keep going on. And out of that uh, fire retention, right, uh, you know, became an industry. And I remember, uh, you know, some of the meetings that I was in with uh, Andy Grove. Uh, you know, I, you know, one particular meeting was uh, Andy and I uh, with uh, Bill Gates and uh, Jim Alchin, right, one of the senior architects of Microsoft at the time. And it was the, one of the famous uh, meetings where Bill took a shoe off and he's banging his shoe on the table, oh, yelling yeah. at Andy Grove and I. It was just incredible, right, in retrospect. And I was there, right? Yeah, you know, it was just one of those kind of things where, boy, that was fiery tension between uh, those guys. And I remember, in fact, it was at, after that meeting when, you know, Bill and, you know, just, you know, and I says, you know, Andy, I says, uh, you know, you were incredibly calm with Bill, right, right, uh, in it. And then he said to me this line, that I didn't realize the significance of it until I read the Swimming Across book, mm. right? But he says, oh, right, I've seen far worse. I've looked in the eyes of dictators, <laughs> right? And he had seen the eyes of Adolf Hitler, mm -hmm. right, at the time. And it's sort of like, okay, yep, you, know, yeah. you can have a, uh, a, a ranting Bill <laughs> Gates or a uh, Adolf Hitler, Andy had seen them both. Right, so yeah, and that was you know part of this uh, deep, extraordinary uh, respect I always had for Andy. But you know, meetings with Bill and Andy, you know, these were like two intellectual titans, you know, coming together. And you've seen, you know, how the uh, you know mountain sheep butt heads, you know, that's what that's the image that was always in my mind. It's sort of like here they come, here they come, here they come, bam, right, and hit each other. But uh, you show up for a meeting with Bill Gates, he had done his homework, right. He was not only the smartest guy in the room, but he had done his homework, right? And to me, that was always one of these kind of things where, you know, the, these uh, early shaping forces of the industry were really quite extraordinary. During your time designing the 486 is when Andy Grove becomes CEO of Intel. And it also becomes where, I, I think the period of time, correct me if I'm wrong, where the real implications of like being the sole source for the 386 comes like the um, the success the upside of that strategy begins to show itself. So, did that when you're working on the 486? Um, did that add to the kind of uh, weight of the project or or the the context and the atmosphere that we're going to sole source this thing again and we're going to keep this dynamic going? Could you? Could you talk about that part of things? Yeah, and the sole source decision was made in the 386, right? right? You know, and well, I'll say there was a lot of sources for the 286. I think at one point there were 14 different companies that could produce the 286. There was essentially only two, IBM and Intel, for the 386. And the 486, part of the architectural battle that was underway, right? You remember you had the National 32,000, you had the Motorola 68,000, you had the uh, IBM uh, 601, and you know, all of these competing uh, microarchitectures coming out at the time. Part of the battle for those was Intel was here to make the 40, you know, was here making the x86 family right. proprietary. Right, and it was before AMD had really risen up as a, you know, as a in architectural uh, competitor, and you know that added to the importance of making the 46 successful, but it also added to this risk and alternative an alternative architecture perspective that we have to succeed, because we can't, you know, be solely dependent on Intel. Mm -hmm. So you know it was an, an incredible, I'll say, crucible of pressure. Right of getting the uh, 46 done, the industry was already well underway. Right with the uh, PC compatible uh, industry, so there were ripe and ready customers. You know, some of these were big names. Uh, you know, Dell was now starting to really emerge, and IBM, of course, had you know built their architectures and their attempts to rebuild the architecture with microchannel were not having uh, success. Uh, Compaq, of course, was racing forward to become the biggest computer company on the planet. But then you got all of these others. Uh, you know, had uh, NEC and Fujitsu 
too in Japan. You had uh, Apricot and Siemens and, you know, these companies emerging. And, you know, I remember uh, in the early days of the 46, uh, we had, uh, you know, and I think it was maybe the first 500,000 chips that we had sold. I get a spreadsheet that showed me the top 10 customers for the uh, 486, and I only recognized five of them, mm. right? Because the personal computer industry was born, right? This compatible industry, right? That a motherboard out of Taiwan could be assembled with a microprocessor, right? An operating system from Microsoft and compatible software, and boom, you know, people were showing up in China and India and Europe, right? Delivering personal computers with names we had never heard of. Right uh, at that point in time, and and as that emerged, right, you know, it really became this uh, period of time where okay, Intel won, right, and it wasn't clear at the end of the 386 if we had won or not, right. right? But in that period of time when the 486 and then the, the DX2, right, uh, you know, uh, Intel was ahead process-wise, architecturally, it was you know the DX2 in fact was faster than any risk machine at the time. Right, so not only had we, you know, uh, been able to win the compatibility argument, but it was even winning the performance argument, something that was impossible, you know, to have conceived of, right? And of course, we did it because it was compatible. We were able to bring the chip to market so rapidly, benefit from Moore's law, you know, benefits uh, that we had as we were able to jump into the next process uh, technology, you know, hit uh, 66 and eventually 100 megahertz before anybody else had gotten past 50. So even though there was some instruction set compatibility overhead, which was there, you know, we just overwhelmed it with Moore's Law and board and, and operating system and compiler uh, compatibility that the industry would never be the same and x86 just became this dominant architecture and it was in that period of time in the late in the late 80s where all of those things were starting to come together and by you know 92 93 you know while uh, you know let, let's say as the saying goes the fat lady might not have sung yet but the architecture battle was over right the x86 had won and the 90s were just really seeing that uh, come to uh, you know full fruition so how did how how long did you stay with the 486? Like when did you when did you begin your next thing? How did that work? Yeah. So uh, you know the 486 super successful. I was then managing the uh, PC business for Intel. Sort of moved into the you know the next layer of leadership. Uh, I was then asked to go lead a project. Uh, Andy asked me to lead a project uh, in personal video conferencing. Right uh, for a period of time, and uh, you know I want to do the job. You know largely because Andy asked me to. You know he had he asked me to climb the Eiffel Tower. Right, I climbed the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> you, know, I, you know he was this uh, you know uh, you know extraordinary figure in my life. But you know Intel was getting worried about what's going to be the thing that consumes these MIPS. Yeah. Right, you know, and that was becoming the dominant. And video, and this is before you know, video was anything uh, of significance on the PC. You know, we had yet to have the first uh, MP3 players. We're just starting to emerge. Right, uh, the idea of uh, video being played on a personal computer. Oh, wow! You really? You know, uh, you know, things that we just take for granted today. And, you know, we were showing these, you know, you know, 480 frames at, uh, you know, six or eight frames per second. And we were so excited. And I remember one time showing it to my wife. She said, that's ugly. <laughs> yeah, I was like, how can you call it ugly? Right? That's a technological achievement of great success. Let me tell you about how DCT work and right, how keyframes work and all this other, you know, she's like, it's ugly. Right? <laughs> you know, Oh, but that was, you know, in that fray, you know, so I went and worked on that uh, for several years, and we made a fundamental error. Huh. We what bet on that? ISDN. Oh. Right? So we bet on that, you know, as the, you know, as the communications, the thing that would replace POTS uh, at the time, you know, the uh, PSTN uh, network. Obviously, that was a bad choice, and, you know, we struggled, and so that was a f my first major failure mm. at Intel. And uh, the product became called ProShare. And uh, in fact, after working on that for a couple of years and the failure of that uh, uh, project, we had a, at the sales conference of Intel, we had a parody on uh, ProShare and it was called PrayShare. 
<laughs> you know, we pray that it's going to be successful uh, someday, and we're going to create video conferencing. So uh, it, I didn't even realize Intel had a video conferencing yeah. business. Or yeah. was it a business or only a project? I mean, did it turn? It into was a it? project. We, you know, we launched product uh, launch for product. it. Eventually, we sold those projects to PitcherTel. Right, you know, eventually as we exited the business, but you know, the business never got that large, right. right? And it was my first major failure, but I learned an extraordinary amount because now I had, you know, software engineers working for me, communications engineers. We started to work with the FCC, right, on ISDN, and just, you know, it was an, you know, and and I find this over and over in your career, uh, my career, and other people's careers that lots often your greatest periods of learning come out of your failures, right? So extraordinary period of learning for me, right? And uh, my next major assignment after that was to become the CTO for Intel. Flashing forward though from, I mean, video on computers has become a gigantic, I guess what Gordon Moore would have called a transistor sink. You could call it a cycle yeah. instruction sink or whatever. Yeah. But I mean, it maybe the timing, maybe you know, the particular just, technology, yeah. but I mean, v video conferencing, video over computer, I mean, has become a, yeah, a and huge it was a resource. Yeah, you know, this period of time when uh, you know well, video was seen as too hard of a workload mm -hmm. to run on the x86, and you might remember there were companies like Chips and Technology, yeah. right, and uh, was the Magic uh, Media, right, uh, companies and others like that. They were doing special purpose video processors to add into your computer, right, to get it work. And Microsoft was coming out with some of the basic uh, Windows Media uh, capabilities. So all those were starting to emerge, but it was just, you know, we were pushing the edge of the, of the technological envelope. It wasn't quite there to be mainstreamed uh, yet. And a whole lot of companies thought they were going to establish sort of the next major architectural footprint by doing those workloads. And then what happened? Well, you know, we added the multimedia MMX yeah. to the uh, Pentium. And, you know, so now instructions that were truly optimized to running media and video uh, workloads. Uh, so now it became popularized and Microsoft did the right things in terms of the operating system to deal with media workloads, audio uh, and video. And now, of course, everybody does it. Right. You know, you do it on you know, your you know, phones and everything like that. But at that time and, you know, that early uh, 90s uh, era, you know, was oh, we just couldn't quite get there. But, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, and obviously Kodak was a big player with some of the core digital video technologies uh, at the time. And we, of course, know what happened to that story. Uh, and uh, many of those companies that were doing special purpose processors at the time, you know, specifically in that area, like CNT, Waytech, and others, right, you know, made a business and then the business disappeared. Right as the x86 processor became possible in doing it, uh, we added the uh, floating point processor on chip in the 486. You know, it was a big deal because you might remember the 387 was a huge business for Intel. Waytech was uh, doing those as special purpose chips, and that was really this, uh, as I called it, the big sucking sound of Moore's law. <laughs> right, anything that was on that motherboard. Right, that could be brought into that big transistor pool of the x86 sitting at the middle would be, right? Caches and media and floating point and you know bringing those uh, on. And uh, once you put it inside of the basic processor, every software application could rely on it, right? And that was the magic that you now started to unleash at the software spiral, uh, as we called it, because if it was special. Well, then you had to add a board to your computer, and you had to get the special software, and it was heavy on the user, and, yeah. right, uh, at the time. But when we added it to the microprocessor, magic, because then the operating system would assume it's there. The compiler would assume it's there, and software could always build uh, on top of it. And, that, and this was the ext an extraordinary period for Intel and the personal computer industry where, uh, and I remember we started what we called, uh, as I became the uh, CTO for Intel, we started what we called uh, the Intel Developer Forum, yeah. right? And literally, that was the place the industry came together. Why? Because if it was in the Intel platform, everybody could build on it. If it wasn't, nobody would build on it, 
right? It was really this defining point where, you know, that was where the industry future was defined. It's, it's really interesting to hear you describe it that way because I, it's almost like, um, you know, there's so much kind of software within the microprocessor, you know, in, in terms of, well, microcode and all this sort of microcode, things. Microcode, bias, also, and drivers. And, but yeah. also in a way that, you know, mm -hmm. some of the logic that's in there is equivalent yeah. to software. So you're, you're almost talking about, like, this software platforms that are put into the silicon that really facilitate the wider use of, of software that does particular kinds of applications, be mm -hmm. it video, media, um, whatever it is, communications, yeah. speech processing, stuff. et cetera, yeah. security, yes. But I had never really thought about it in that way of, of, of how the microprocessor becomes like an enabling, that really very directly an enabling platform that makes certain types of software more um, accessible, practical, cheaper. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is, yeah, is that really was, a fair picture? Yeah, it's a very fair picture. And in fact, we spent an extraordinary amount of time in that, that period of time building up. You know, today you'd call an ISV program. Mm -hmm. Oh, the hardware guy's got to go work with the software guys. Today you take it for granted. At this point in time, nobody did that, mm -hmm. right? You know, we really were inventing what that meant, right, to be able to get software and get software guys really building on it, right? Because you always end up with this time lag problem. Well, I need you to write software for hardware that hasn't been invented yet. Can you do that? Right? You know, and of course, nobody would do that because you couldn't, mm. right? You know, you might have emulators and stuff like that, but they were always so crappy that, uh, you know, unless you were super motivated, right, for some reason that, right, uh, drove you, you wouldn't ever even try that, right? And then the, economically wouldn't make any sense. Because then you'd say, well, until that hardware is broadly available, why would I ever commit it to a piece of software that I'm trying to distribute in the industry? So trying to defy that hardware-software boundary and the normal you know, time lag and enabling of these key new software functions was a huge issue uh, for us through the 90s. Right? And that was you know, very much uh, you know, how to break through that and, and crack many of those problems was a key aspect of you know, what I did in the, uh, say, when I became CTO for Intel, Right, you know, CTO for almost uh, five years and just an extraordinary period of my, you know, time and history as I was, uh, you know, in the early 90s, also helping to create the key hardware standards, right? It's where USB, Wi-Fi, PCI, AGP, you know, graphics uh, interfaces were critical and, you know, we were responsible and I was, you know, critically involved in, you know, many of those uh, things. When I get up and speak to audiences uh, today, I you know, describe it that I've had the Cinderella career, and if you've ever used a personal computer uh, connected on uh, Wi-Fi or used USB, I worked on it, right? <laughs> it's like, oh, of course, you know. How many of you haven't used one of those three things, right? Yeah. So which years, so that was, was it 2000 to 2005 that you were CTO of Intel? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And was that... Was that a new role? Yeah, it was great because uh, Craig Barrett was CEO right. uh, for Intel uh, uh, right there in the late 90s or early 2000 uh, period. And uh, I had taken sabbatical. Intel had a sabbatical uh, program. And when I left on sabbatical, I didn't know what I was going to do when I got back. So get back from our uh, sabbatical. And uh, there's a note on my chair uh, to uh, call Craig. Right? And uh, basically is, we like you to be CTO. It's like, oh, it sounds pretty interesting. What's a CTO? Right? And uh, he says, I don't know, figure it out and tell me. <laughs> so what I did was, right, as we're starting to formulate what a CTO meant uh, uh, for Intel at the time, I went and interviewed 50 CTOs. Right, you know, so I, I remember, you know, it was uh, Craig Monday had been named the CTO for Microsoft. Uh, Greg Papadopoulos was the CTO for Sun. Uh, uh, what was his name? Uh, Bill Reduschel was the CEO for AOL. Right, and, you know, I remember those four. But you know, I, I interviewed 50 CTOs, and what I found was is that CTO was the most ill-defined C title of any of them. Mm -hmm. 
You know, you know what a CEO does, you know what a CFO does, you know what a chief counsel does, but a CTO, you know, some of them had R&D, some didn't. You know, some were in charge of intellectual property, some weren't. You know, some had labs, some didn't. You know, it was, you know, it was a very ill-defined job. So I decided, hmm, there's no definition for CTO, so I'll define it in my own Im image for exactly what I want to do, right? <laughs> and then I can be entirely successful at it because it's exactly what I want to do. Uh, but, uh, you know, so really sort of defined the uh, job spec for uh, being a CTO at Intel, got Ann, uh, got Craig and Andy to agree uh, on that definition. It became the first ever CTO uh, for Intel, and it was a glorious period uh, of time. How did you define it? Well, you know, I decided that Intel, that it had to be lab, you, you had to have earnest money. To get something done at Intel, you had to show up with real resources and real ideas. Right? Otherwise, you know, the business units, the fab guys, you had nothing. So I said, we must have a lot of these advanced development labs working directly for me under my budget. Right? So I insisted that we pull these labs together. And it was a bit of a political battle inside of the company at the time. But I said, you know, it has to be mine. Right? And I uh, got uh, Craig to support that. Also, I had to support research funding. You know, what we were doing in the upstream pipeline in the universities as well. You know, uh, also, I took over the patent program, and I owned the uh, uh, senior technical ladder for the company. So I was in charge of who became fellows, who became principal engineers, uh, uh, et cetera. So really, you know, in some ways, it was controlling those things gave me power, right? But it also said it created, right, uh, real technological leadership. Uh, as well. So pulling those things together became the uh, role for CTO, but very much things like we already touched on, like with Intel Developer Forum and so on, we were going to set the future of the x86 industry, right? And out of that came things like USB, right? We were going to attack these hard problems, you know, like upgrading a PC, opening it up, shoving in boards and so on. No, we're going to define plug and play, which today, of course, you know, that's obvious, right? Well, in that period of time, it wasn't obvious, right? You know, we're going to create wireless connectivity. Oh, you know, I need an Ethernet jack. Remember, Intel helped create Ethernet. No, we're going to do it all wirelessly. Oh, wow, how's that going to work? We had to fight, you know, uh, battles. Today, you take Wi-Fi for granted. But in that period of time, it was not for granted. There were competing standards in Europe, particularly in China. Uh, one uh, called WAPI that came out of China at the time that they wanted to control their own, right? You know, and they were driving that as a standard into the ITU, right? So uh, I learned more about international standards, ITU, global diplomacy. I took seven trips to China in one year, wow. right? Specifically uh, fighting some of those uh, uh, battles. I remember we had uh, the chair of the former chair of the FCC on the board of Intel at the time. And I started describing him, the, the, the WAPI uh, Reed Hunt, uh, and uh, this WAPI battle with him, and I'm giving him some of the technical uh, uh, ins and outs of the issue. He says, Pat, stop, shut up. This has nothing to do with technology. This is brazen politics, right? You know, and here's the FCC chair giving me my tutorial lesson in international politics. Right, which is just extraordinary, and you know how to negotiate state departments and international trade and ITUs and so on. So just some extraordinary things, you know, came out of that uh, period of time. Things that today we take for granted, and were, you know, came out of that period of time when I was the CTO for Intel. It was really a superb, you know, uh, opportunity to grow, learn, and really help to shape the industry that we take for granted today. So I had a question about that. Um, you said you define the future of the x86 or the personal computer. What about the next step, the things beyond, you know, the personal computer, you know, the mobile, the uh, other things that have evolved since then? Was that, how did that fit into Intel's strategy and, and your role in that? Yeah, and some of those things, clearly uh, things like uh, Wi-Fi, Centrino, et cetera, were sort of in the tail end. When I was uh, CTO, I, you know, uh, in uh, January of 2005, I moved back to take over microprocessor development for Intel. It's when we were in the, uh, the middle of the mobile, uh, uh, when we were in the middle of the multi-core and AMD Opteron. Mm -hmm. 
right, battle uh, for it. So I moved back over to become, you know, in charge of microprocessors and desktops and servers uh, and so on to take that battle on. Because you might remember, you know, Intel created the industry standard x86 server. Right uh, at the time, and AMD was eating our lunch. So you know, I left the CTO role, and about the time when I left the CTO role was the period when a lot of these mobile conversations started to come to the fore, mm -hmm. right? You know, as well. And Intel struck out, right, and not just three strikes, like five strikes in its mobile strategy, right? Absolutely dominated personal computers, absolutely dominated data centers in the cloud, and absolutely struck out. Right when it came to mobile computing and uh, mobile devices, and most of those things didn't work for me uh, at the time. And I was sort of, you know, where you got some of the things, some of the technologies uh, uh, underway. But uh, you know, you might recall some of the, uh, you know, that's when Qualcomm's ascendancy was really starting to uh, emerge. Uh, the uh, mobile phone was starting to become seen as an important uh, form factor uh, into the future. Uh, you know, the first, you know, moving from analog to digital, right, uh, in that space. And uh, Intel uh, made some very, very bad choices. Ones that uh, you know I argued quite strongly against at the time. Things like WiMAX, et cetera, you know, were big investments in the part of uh, uh, Intel. And uh, my role had largely shifted by that point in time, so I wasn't in charge of it anymore, but uh, I was a uh, uh, quite the uh, critic of some of those decisions for Intel. It seemed that just, it seemed like the strategy on mobile was kind of whipsawing around, but um, it seemed like on the server side, it was very, you know, focused on that kind of x86 architectural hold Moore's Law strategy. Is, yeah, that, was, is that fair? Well, the yeah, se several things uh, were occurring. You know, w one was we, we had gotten, uh, I'll say, very thoughtfully started to build what an industry standard server could look like. And the idea of defining the server, the hardware components, the BIOS components, and starting to build that up, you know, a real ecosystem that could build server motherboards. All right? Because remember, this is the period of time where the risk machines dominated the server landscape. Right, you had HP UX running on uh, uh, the uh, uh, HP architecture. You had Spark, right, right as an architecture, and the Sun uh, platform. You had uh, AS 400s from IBM running on RS 6000s. You know, so it was a very verticalized industry, and we took a very PC-centric view of that. But building that industry standard server, so that was getting uh, uh, underway uh, quite nicely. Uh, for us at the time, so it was a very thoughtful uh, strategy. We feared Sun, right, and what they were doing with Spark uh, at the time, and you know they were really seen as the enemy. Uh, and then when Opteron launched and started to eat our in-architecture lunch, you know, because we created all of the BIOS standards, the networking standards, how all of this is going to work, the you know the x86 server industry is starting to take off. Right in that you know, uh, time frame, and then Opteron's launch in 2003. You know the you know we were up here at like 97 percent market share in x86 servers. It dipped down into the 60s. Oh wow, I hadn't realized it was yeah. that. Yeah, and the average selling price had halved. So our market share had halved, and the average selling price had halved at the hands of AMD Opteron. And uh, this was at the end of the period where I was the CTO uh, for Intel. And I remember I laid out the multi-core strategy for Intel, right, in this period of time. We're now 2004, 2000, uh, late 2003, 2004. Uh, one of my famous papers that I wrote, you know, was the nuclear uh, paper, right, which basically described that the power density of us staying on the single core uh, approach to computing would create thermal densities that would rival that of the sun. Right, you know, and how unattainable and unachievable that is. And, you know, just like I talked about the test industry before, the cooling industry was betting on those thermal densities. And I, you know, in fact, there's a professor at Stanford who I had just met with the other day, and he was complaining that I killed one of his startup companies that was uh, doing a, a thermal cooling uh, technology specifically to solve that. But, you know, and that, out of that uh, multi core transition, 
I moved out of the CTO role, had laid out that strategy, then moved back into the development role and really began that multi-core uh, strategy, the TikTok development model that Intel became uh, famous uh, for uh, as well and began the assault on AMD. Right? And I'll say, you know, part of it was we had done good architectural work, you know, good business strategy work on how to create that standard industry, and we had a clear enemy named AMD Opteron, right? And I'll say, you know, good strategy, clear focus, right? You know, who you're out to compete with. And, uh, you know, that began a journey from 2005 to uh, uh, nine, where it was, we are gonna win them back and we are gonna crush them. And uh, obviously we did a pretty good job, right? And uh, Intel's market share after that was higher than it was before, and our ASP was higher than it was before. So not only had we recovered everything, but we had gained more, and of course, that became the foundation for today. All forms of data centers, all forms of clouds, all forms of public clouds have been you know, built on those you know, fundamental industry standards, scale out, multi-core uh, server uh, components. And you know, every one of us uses those many times a day, every time you access a website, you don't even think about it. Well, it's in, in our own personal computer, there are multi-core. Yeah, yeah. 